Okay, I guess I can start. Right, let me now uh, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Stephen Lensing, who is uh, a professor in the Asian School of Environment and co-director of the Complexity Institute at NTU. He is an emeritus professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona, a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Center, an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute and the Vienna Complexity Hub, and president of the Anthropology and Environment Society of the American Anthropological Association. In 2012, he developed a UNESCO World Heritage for the Subaks and Water Temple Networks of Bali. So ladies and gentlemen, let us now welcome Professor Stephen Lansing, please. Thanks very much. Uh, I am indeed an anthropologist like uh, Roland, who just unkindly pointed out that he just covered the first seven million years and I've got like a couple of decades to deal with, um, which is fine, except the problem is uh, he is an expert, as you've gathered, on what he, what he just talked about, whereas I'm not an expert on the Anthropocene. I'm really indulging my dear friend Jan Vosfander by talking about it at all. However, uh, no one, as far as I know, is an expert on the topic of the Anthropocene. I think the idea really does anybody remember the IGBP? It used to be called the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. It was in Stockholm. That's sort of where the climate science uh, uh, questions were first debated in the grand auspices of the Swedish Royal Academy of Science. Anyway, um, if you've listened to these guys re recently, the climate scientists, ecologists, uh, oceanographers here in uh, this is the 2011 meeting of the Geological Sciences of America have been talking about the Anthropocene. Um, so probably if anybody is an expert, it would be Will Stephan. He's the, I think he's the guy who started this, he and Paul Crutzen. Anyway, what is the Anthropocene? Well, the, the, the uh, uh, definition here is it's the current geological age. And by current, we're probably talking on a time scale of decades or maybe a couple of centuries. That's under debate. Viewed as the period during which human activity has become the dominant influence on climate and the environment. So Roland spoke of an evolving relationship between humans and the Earth, but mostly focusing on what it's been doing to humans. In this case, the emphasis shifts to what's happening to the Earth. So I'm going to take you very briefly back in the past, the Pleistocene, when, as Roland just told us, we became human. The end of the Pleistocene is this little period called the Holocene, so the Holocene, here we have, I, can I pick this thing up and walk? I can do that, right? So, because I need to be able to point and this won't show you points. So here's the famous Vostok ice core. And uh, here you have fluctuations in the carbon dioxide levels. And so as you can see, they're, they're very, there's a lot of change happening during the Pleistocene. Great time to evolve. This last period is the Holocene. It begins at the end of the Pleistocene. It's about 12,000 years or so. It's when agriculture and cities and all those great things happened. And uh, we think that, you know, the, if you ask the question, why did this happen in the last 12,000 years rather than, oh, say, 100,000 years when we were just as smart? Um, well, one answer, the usual answer to that question is it's because the climate was stable. It was an extremely agreeable period of time in which to, uh, to become a farmer. So Holocene, here's the human population. You all know this picture, but, but the numbers are still striking. It took you know, 300,000 years to reach the first billion, skipping on down 15 years to reach the fourth billion, 12 years to reach the fifth and sixth billion. We are on a hyper exponential exp um, expansion of the human population. And now here we are. Question is, have we now moved into a new era, the Anthropocene? which follows the Holocene. And for a geologist, the question is, are there changes in the Earth that are detectable, that can be measured, that we can see, that would indicate that we've entered a new geological age? So that's, our, that's the question I will be touching upon. Uh, and indeed, the first figure to cite is, you know, here we are indeed at 7 billion humans and, and, uh, and growing, right? So is this a tipping point? in the relationship of humans to the Earth. And I work in the Complexity Institute, so we have, we're interested in tipping points. And I, I may be able to tell you something you haven't thought about that's relevant to that question, the notion of human society being at a tipping point. So here we are, you know, a few pictures. There's what we've been up to lately, right? 
we're clearly changing the face of the Earth. Will Stefan, who's the climate scientist I refer to, probably if there's anybody who's an expert, it would be Will. So his Anthropocene equation that he's proposed is, for the last four billion years, the state of the Earth, Delta Earth, right, is a function of astronomical, geophysical, and internal dynamics of the planet, whereas in the last 40 years, change in the Earth is mostly due to industrialized societies with the other causes going to zero. So that's his, you know, humorous but pointed way of capturing the notion. So let's look at the big picture. Here we are. This is really going to go even further back in time, Roland. So here we are on the Earth where the temperature has changed but remained remarkably stable for the last 10 to 3 billion years, despite the fact that the sun has gotten over that period of time about 30% warmer. So how is it that, this, that the temperature of the Earth has remained relatively constant given the fact that the, the, the Sun has been heating things up? Because in Mars, for example, the temperature increased, tracking that increasing luminosity of the Sun. So also Venus, it once had an Earth-like atmosphere, and um, in effect it experienced a, run, a runaway greenhouse effect surface water evaporated, entered the atmosphere, and now it's extremely hot in Venus. So the question becomes, what, it, what made the Earth so hospitable to life? Obviously, that's a hugely complicated question, and we had to invent a new word for it, biogeochemistry, and we now have people who are applying for positions in the university who are biogeochemists, so it's a new field. Um, and first step, clearly, will be to simplify the problem. So I'm going to give you the simplest model developed by uh, James Lovelock years ago to try to uh, answer the question I just posed with respect to the, to, the, um, to the Earth. So Daisy World is an imaginary planet identical to the Earth, circling a sun that is identical to our sun. The only difference is only two living things grow on Daisy World black daisies, and white daisies. So here we are in Daisy World, and it starts out pretty cold when the, the Daisy World sun was older and colder. And so we see the sun around the equator, a few of the plants, let's say we, we assume they can grow best at, I think it's 24 degrees. So they're able to grow along the equator because it's warm enough for plants to survive. And then as we move through time from an old, cool sun to the present, the temperature on Daisy World should be tracking the increasing luminosity of Daisy World's sun, and eventually it's going to get pretty hot. But instead on Daisy World, the flowers have an effect, and the temperature stabilizes on Daisy World. The mechanism that makes that happen is the black daisies absorb a little more heat and they acquire a selective advantage because they warm it up a little bit, so it's a little bit the temperature that is ideal. They're more closely approximating the temperature that daisies like. So the black daisies start to grow, and they outcompete the white daisies. And as they grow, they gradually change the albedo of the whole planet. Daisy world gets darker and warmer, and that works well until we cross this threshold when now the sun is trying to heat up Daisy World hotter than the plants would like it. However, there are still some white daisies. So the white daisies start to take over. They now acquire a selective advantage because they reflect the heat. So they grow a little faster, and by simple natural selection, the white daisies gradually take over. And that stabilizes, continues to stabilize the temperature with this simple feedback relationship until we reach this point when it's too hot for daisies to grow, okay? So this is daisy world with daisies, and that's when all the daisies die because even a planet covered with white daisies can't maintain, you know, it gets to be too hot, and the temperature suddenly shoots up and daisy world becomes a dead planet, okay? So there we have the planet with and without daisies. Nice model, right? One parameter, temperature, two living things, and yet you can get a relationship, a feedback relationship that will answer the question, can life stabilize? Is it possible for living things to have an effect on things like biogeochemical um, dynamics on the planetary scale?
Okay, now, continuing this experiment, imagine that a spaceship lands on Daisy World, and the astrobiologists go out and they discover that they're only black and white daisies, so they have plenty of time to study the black and the white daisies. It's the only living things on the planet, right? And they discover that the daisies grow best at 22 and a half degrees. And so they conclude that the daisies have adapted to the ambient temperature of Daisy World. Is that correct? No. They've adapted the planet. The daisies have adapted the planet. That's why it's 22 and a half degrees on Daisy World. Okay? So, meanwhile, they brought a marketing guy on the spaceship, and he thinks that uh, Daisy World has a commercial potential for the interstellar flower trade. Okay? So, now we're imagining it's far in the future. Daisy World's sun is already pretty hot. It's mostly white daisies. And he suggests massive harvesting of the daisies to lower the costs. And he volunteers to stay on the planet to run the machines. Would you sell him a life insurance policy? Clear? Massive harvesting, all of a sudden there'd be this moment and then boop, right, that would be it. I mean, we'd have that tipping point. We'd have a phase transition in Daisy World as it got extremely hot. Okay, so the question then becomes, what has this got to do with uh, planetary boundaries. The notion of planetary boundaries maybe, I don't know, it's probably 10 years ago now that a large number of eminent scientists wrote a great paper in Nature and said, are there planetary boundaries? Are there limits to the effects of humans on the planets which will make it impossible for either A, the planet, or B, us to survive? So we're looking at biosphere integrity, climate change, and so forth. So we'll take a little tour through some of those planetary boundaries. Um, I'm not going to say much about climate, but here's some interesting stuff. This is, uh, you know, what will happen if we put it in all in the air? Put it all in the air. This is trillions of tons of carbon, and that's the average temperature increase based upon several of the climate models, standard models. Okay, so if we, oops, uh, if we get up past four or five trillion tons, we are going to move between, it depends on the model, right? Four to eight degrees. Does that matter? We can handle temperatures. It's maybe uncomfortable, but we can handle them, right? Well, a very interesting paper just a few years ago on the adaptability limit to heat stress of humans. Um, and it goes like this. So how do we regulate temperature? Well, we like to be 37 degrees, and we regulate our skin temperature to stay below 35 degrees. Here's the punchline, or the interesting point. Temperature on Earth can go up to 50 degrees, right, in, uh, in places like Saudi Arabia. But the effective temperature with respect to your thermal regulation is what's called the wet bulb temperature. So the wet bulb temperature is the temperature of a bulb with a wet sock on it whirled around. And what is the effect of cooling given humidity and air moving on your body as well as the ambient temperature? And it turns out if you look at the wet bulb temperature, Saudi Arabia does not hit 50 degrees. We couldn't survive there. We'd pass out from the heat. I mean, it hit 50 degrees, but the wet, but it's very dry. And so it's the combination of humidity, air movement, and ambient temperature that determines the adaptability threshold for humans. So that's a much lower temperature. Highest instantaneous wet bulb temperature on Earth is about 30 degrees. So that's comfortable. That's the highest temperature. But think back to that previous graph. Here are these climate models which forecast changes that could, there's four degrees more. We actually could um, make things very uncomfortable by increasing that temperature. Okay, so can we fix this? I think you told me not to be too depressing, Jan, so. I'm going to try. Okay, so, well, we want to have one great uh, example of a successful innovation. I don't know if you, if you haven't heard this, if you have, just bear in mind. Researchers began that, to work bear with me, this is an interesting story, whether you've heard it before. When this University is uh, of California Montreal's climate Sherry change. Sherry and Mario Molina testified before Congress that man-made CFCs, a key ingredient of common aerosol sprays, could destroy ozone in the stratosphere. In 1985, researchers with the British Antarctic Survey announced abnormally low ozone concentrations above Halley Bay near the South Pole. 
Our planet had an ozone hole, and it was rapidly growing. In a remarkable display of international cooperation, an ozone treaty was negotiated only two years later. The Montreal Protocol regulates the production of CFCs and other ozone-destroying chemicals. First signed in September 1987, it has since been ratified by every member of the United Nations. Because of this agreement, ozone is now on the mend. Ozone holes still open every year above the South Pole, but thanks to the treaty, ozone-destroying chemicals have either leveled off or decreased. At this rate, the ozone layer could recover almost fully by 2050. To ensure that ozone really is recovering, NASA has been flying ozone sensors in Earth orbit. Yep. Okay. So, this study was published in 1974, and the chairman of DuPont described it as a load of utter rubbish. But then the British Antarctic Survey did a lot of measurements to test those results. Two years later, as you just saw, the Montreal Protocol was signed and the Nobel Prize came a few years later. So, and every nation on Earth signed that protocol. So, that's a great success story. The worst, world's first universally ratified treaty. So, is this, this would appear to be reasonably could be considered to be the expansion of our steering capacity, our government steering capacity to the global scale. Let's look at it for a moment. It was signed in September of 1987. It was shortly after that that uh, so. the results of the Antarctic aircraft expedition came out and the decision was made on Friday afternoon, three days after the release of the report, that uh, we would commit to a total phase out of CFCs. It was the first time I had ever seen companies come together on something that if they withheld information and kept it proprietary, it would give them a competitive advantage. I think the number one lesson is you have to have really good science. It has to be done extremely carefully. It has to be verified by multiple sets of observations and by multiple different uh, models. We need to have coordinated research globally and international assessments so that the scientific community talks with one voice to the international negotiators. Because of the spirit of cooperation with the government setting standards that were challenging yet flexible, allowed industry to innovate, industry came forward, and uh, everyone worked together to make this happen. I th and that's, that's the DuPont guy. So this looks very good. But um, there's more to it than just atmosphere, okay? So ocean atmosphere coupling is key. Uh, I'll remind you of this discovery. I mean, the question that David Keeling asked is, can the oceans take care of the extra CO2? And so we began these observations on the summit of Mount Mauna, uh, Mauna Kea, just measuring CO2. So here's what he saw. Can you read it? Um, plant regrowth removes the CO2. And over the years, Keeling noticed a long-term pattern in his CO2 data. From 318 parts per million in May 1958. by April 2014. The famous Chinese hoax. <laughs> so there, you know, here we are with reductions. So here's the potential 2010 they estimate. <laughs> 
there's more to the Anthropocene than the question of climate. Here are a series of, anth of indicators. All of them accelerate in 1950. So let's look at a few of them. You can't see them, so I'll just, but there are lots of them. So here we have global biodiversity. That's 1900, that's 1950. Here we have the amount of domesticated land. Here we have the loss of tropical rainforests and woodlands. Here we have uh, the exploitation of estuaries in the ocean. Since 1950, the population has tripled. Here we go with a few more. Fertilizer consumption, water use, damming of rivers, population, total re-GDP, paper consumption, etc., etc. All those things just shoot up. So, do we have measurable indicators for a new geological epoch? Here are a few possible measurable indicators. One of them is the atmospheric gases that we see in the ice cores. That's what we started with. It's also been proposed that we could date the Anthropocene with the radioactive isotopes that were deposited by the first atomic bomb test that left a pretty good deposit around the planet that can be seen by a geologist. There's also the sixth extinction. This is favored by conservation biologists who say we have had a measurable impact on biodiversity that, can, that is also a quantitative measurable index of, of a planetary scale change. And now, most recently, plastics, okay? So question, given these rising indicators, are there tipping points like Daisy World? If you recall, that was a tipping point. Okay, so uh, a tipping point just means a nonlinear change. So in a linear change, the effect is proportionate to the cause. A nonlinear change is one in which the effect is not proportionate to the cause. Uh, ecologists call this a regime shift. Physicists call it a nonlinear transition, but we'll stick with regime shift, and they can be very abrupt. So, for example, here we have uh, the Sahara. 6,000 years ago, there were giraffes and animals in the Sahara, and that's what it looks like today. So, these are cores not of ice, but of uh, sunk in the seabed off the coast of Africa, recording the deposit of dust, you know, windblown dirt. So you can get a core of that and take it out and look at it and see what is the composition of that dirt. And it shifts from uh, full of biotic material to sandy. Um, here, this is the aeolian dust, the windblown dust deposited in the sea off the coast of West Africa and there you see the change, which coincides with the change that we see on the ground with the, uh, the replacement of vegetation with Sahara. So that's a tipping point. This is uh, the green Sahara. As far as we know, we didn't cause this, okay? Not a human cause, probably. Nobody really knows, but uh, probably not a human anthropogenic effect. So the question becomes, what, which changes matter? Uh, and I refer you to this diagram because I think we're all going to become familiar with it through time. This is asking the question, what is a safe operating space for humanity? Meaning, how much can the oceans absorb acid? How, how acidic can the oceans be? Or how much nitrogen? And all of the, the basic changes that we're making, what, are the, what is the boundary condition under which a stable, safe human society is possible, and it's sort of down here. So um, that, that's an interesting way to think about it. That's, we don't have answers to this question. They're estimates, but it's a way of asking the question. It's a way of asking the question. So, uh, well, we're not actually thinking much about that question, and that's the problem. So 2014, the G20 nations agreed to invest 60 to 70 trillion dollars in new infrastructure investments by 2030. 25 million kilometers more dams and hundreds of roads, rather, and hundreds more dams, 90% of which are in the tropics. So what do those numbers mean? Well, the problem with building roads, most of the roads then will happen in the tropics. And the thing about building roads is once you've built them, then feeder roads begin to go off of them and they create 
uh, fragmentation of habitats. It's very predictable, happens everywhere. It's happening just to the west of us in Sumatra, destroying, if plants go through, the last the habitat for the last remaining uh, rhinos and the sociable orangutans in the Loiser Reserve. There's a road that's planned now to go through there, and it will have these effects. So tropics contain 80% of terrestrial biodiversity, and these road, that's what the roads will do. They also contain 95% of the mangroves and the coral reefs. Two-thirds of the world's poorest people. By 2050, 60% of the world's children. And so Bill Lawrence, a great ecologist, says the environmental effects of this infrastructure tsunami could easily dwarf climate change and the acidification of the oceans. Hmm. Speaking of the oceans, okay, are there tipping points for the oceans? Well, one of them, yes, uh, nitrogen fertilizer. So we put, we are putting lots of nitrogen fertilizer into the seas, and this is discovered. There's something called the dead zone off off of uh, the Mississippi Delta in the United States. It was discovered by a woman in Nancy Rabelais, who was about my age, just going on and noticing what happens is. In the summer, when the fertilizer runoff uh, takes place, then too much fertilizer causes algae to bloom. Stuff sinks, and, and uh, uh, as it decomposes the oxygen in the system is used, and it becomes hypoxic, which means that there's not enough oxygen left for sea life to live there. That dead zone has been expanding steadily ever since. But it's not just in the Gulf of Mexico. As you'll see in another slide, it's really all over. So. Um, nitrogen's a good thing, makes proteins, we need it, but too much nitrogen, especially on things like coral reefs, is fatal to the reefs because the reefs are adapted to low nitrogen inputs and so living coral will sustain the reef ecology, but too much fertilizer creates, first the algae blankets it and then eventually you, uh, you kill it. So, these are some of the dead zones. The dead zones meaning the areas that have become hypoxic, meaning that fish that can swim, swim away, but the mollusks and things that can't swim simply die, and those are spreading very rapidly, scaling up from lakes to coastal ecosystems, and that trajectory is not improving, it's just getting worse. Okay. Uh, Another possible tipping point, there's the global meridional overturning circulation. So that's the great ocean conveyor belt that moves around the world and brings cold water up here to the coast of uh, Alaska. So we get great fisheries also down in, in uh, Chile. This is, and it warms, you know, as it's the warming version, as it moves by the British Islands, it's warm and it warms things up. That's the great ocean circulation system and it's very important for the circulation of nutrients on the planetary scale. So there's new evidence that there could be a slowdown in overturning circulation. <clears throat> that has happened before during the Pleistocene, and it happens when the melting of the glaciers causes too much light, fresh water to uh, be introduced to the sea surface. So there is, it's possible for that system to slow down or, in, or need to stop. It happens. It has happened before, and that's something to worry uh, the oceanographers. One more strange tipping point is plastic, simply the sheer magnitude, the sheer magnitude of these things, we suddenly realize, get that. In business as usual, the ocean is expected to contain, by 2050, more plastic than fish. And we've just learned that it's bad for us because the micro, when it decomposes, it doesn't completely go away and we wind up eating it. That's a new topic for health research, right? What's it doing to us as well as to the fish? Uh, there's so many of these things. I, I'll move through them quickly. Also, I don't want to be too depressing. But let's just look at the picture here. So terrestrial biodiversity, just one slide. Here's the human population, 1800 to 2010. And here, extinction rates. Extinction rates are just tracking our population growth. Um, but they're not uniform, so um, depends on where they hit in the, you know, which trophic level. And this study in science 
six years ago says, the loss of the large apex predators may be humankind's most pervasive influence on nature. This is from the perspective of a vertebrate biologist. Because by removing the apex predators, you're changing the whole ecosystem. And that we clearly are doing. Urban growth. You have to indulge me with this slide. One of these systems, I show this to my students, and I say one of these systems takes in raw energy, transforms it into life, cools the earth, cleanses water, absorbs carbon dioxide, and releases oxygen. And the other one does the opposite. Your big cities worry me. <laughs> Those giant cities, maybe, maybe, anyway. All right, uh, so I'm, Rather than review or add to this list, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about the Anthropocene here in Southeast Asia, because we are in the most interesting region in the world with respect to this process, because Borneo has the highest biodiversity of any forest on Earth, more than the Amazon, more than the Congo, right here. Sumatra used to, and Borneo, well, to the extent that Borneo survives, highest terrestrial biodiversity on the planet, right here, right around us. And it happens that we're, where are we now? Here we are, and here's the Coral Triangle, source of the greatest marine biodiversity on the planet. So what happens here really matters. Indonesia, not long ago, was a negligible contributor to global warming. It is now the third largest uh, carbon emitter after the US and China. And the reason for that is not motorcycles. It's the clear cutting and burning of the forests, the greatest terrestrial biodiversity on the planet. That in my lifetime, I have several very good friends who spent their lives studying these forests, like Lisa Curran at Stanford. And as you, as you know from breathing it, right? <laughs> when El Nino happens, the peat swamps, peat is exposed, it gets to be too warm, and we breathe the emissions that come from the burnt forests of our, neighbor, our neighbors in Borneo and Sumatra. So, I'm going to wind up just talking for a minute about the two things we're trying to do with the Earth Observatory. Uh, one of them is, it's a study, we've been studying human biological diversity, basically genetic diversity with the Eichmann Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta. So zoonotic diseases are a worry. Uh, this is a new version of, well, it's a recently popular kind of strand of malaria, uh, which is, like all zoonotic diseases, increases as humans are put into unusually frequent contact with wild animals with whom they were separ formerly separated. So there's a very high risk of the spread of this disease and many others. My colleagues in Jakarta at the Ekman Institute, these are the people in charge of genetic studies in Indonesia. And we have a, I include myself with them because I'm part of the team. We have a network of, of uh, doctors, public health people, in Borneo, keeping an eye out in the local hospitals and schools for emerging diseases, for genetic diseases, because that's where they will come, come from. And the American, I'm happy to say, the Center for Disease Control of the United States is working with, has been working for years with the Institute to try to help you know, pay attention to these changes. So that's one, that's one topic. We're, what we're really doing, I can say one more word, is we want to work with the surviving hunter-gatherer populations, the Punan, who are still in the upland parts of Borneo, as you may know. The lowlands have been turned into oil palms plantations, but the uplands, there's still quite a lot of Borneo that's intact. That's where the surviving hunters and gatherers are, and that's what we'll be working. Um, last, or second project, has to do with rice. So, uh, here we have rice emits a lot of methane, and we grow a lot of rice. Stopping 
the growing of rice maybe isn't the solution to that, so can something be done about the emission of methane? Because it is, it's, or is it? But basically, it's roughly half of the methane from any agricultural crop on the planet comes from, from rice, so it'd be nice to do something about that. And it turns out there's a way, to, there is a way, oh wait, I'll back up, which is um, the reason rice is so efficient at the uh, emission of methane is that the methanogen bacteria get, become active when the soil becomes anaerobic and if you flood the rice paddy that's what happens, it becomes anaerobic and then the rice stalks are little chimneys that allow the gas to go into the atmosphere. So if you reduce the amount of time that the pot paddy is flooded then you can reduce the amount of methane that's produced. It's slightly more complicated because the rice paddy also emits nitrous oxide but by timing the irrigation schedule to, to mitigate both of those factors in, um, I got this picture, just a second. Oh well, uh, by timing, there have been, there's new work by uh, scientists at the University of California, Davis, in California, they've, they, they now have successful plans for reducing uh, the emission of greenhouse gases from flooded rice paddies by about 70, 80 percent. So that's what we're trying to start now in Bali. Um, actually, li literally next week, starting to measure the uh, emission levels from the patties in Bali. Okay, so. This is a but the green revolution still lingers. To this day, farmers add chemical fertilizer to this ancient, self sustaining system. For the last 30 years, the farmers have been borrowing money from the village cooperatives to buy fertilizer that they don't need, applying it to the fields, it washes out of the fields immediately, flows back into the rivers and down to the sea. This little stream is flowing right out of those rice paddies up there. And as it comes down, it's of course carrying all the mineral nutrients from the volcanic soil, plus all that fertilizer. I mean, all the fertilizer that wasn't needed by the farms and is just washing down. So by the time it gets here, the sea, it's like a thin nutrient soup. And so the effect is you grow simple organisms like algae, the algae that you see growing along the rocks there. And that's what we find offshore, just blanketing the coral reefs. And we only find it in places like this where you've got that kind of agricultural drainage. On the rest of the island, if there's no river carrying fertilizer, then the reefs are fine. But out there, the reefs are nearly dead. Yeah, well, so My conclusion is these, pro these problems have snuck up on us. The reason the farmers put too much nitrogen fertilizer on their crops, it goes back to the days of the Green Revolution when Indonesia was struggling to feed itself and so they set up a, a system of subsidizing fertilizer you know, to help people get food, right? There was really nothing wrong with that except that it did not include provision for carefully measure measuring the quantities of fertilizer that were needed, like phosphate. In these Indonesian islands are mostly volcanic. There's loads of phosphate in the volcanic soil. So we need to be a little smarter in terms of adjusting the things that we put into the, into the landscape, like nitrogen, phosphate's not so bad, plastic. These things are just accumulating very quickly. And the, I think the problem is um, there's a lag time in society's ability to, to begin to recognize that magnitude of these problems and the uh, possibilities for mitigation. I mean, the oil palm is destroying the forest. I've worked a lot in these islands. We, we go to the islands and we're doing genetic research. But we go to island after island. By now it's, I think, about 19. And the more, even the most remote island, I'm talking about Tanimbar, Kai, Mentawi Islands, you still find the beginnings, or, or indeed, they're, they're all slated for the spread of palm oil because it's good for packaged food. That could easily change. I mean, that, that's, 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 that could easily change. It's a question of, of recognizing the problem before, before the forests of Mentawe are replaced with more oil palms. Mentawe has a, a native gibbon species that exists only in that island. There are people living in those forests. I mean, uh, wouldn't it be shameful if we just let that fall apart by neglect, really, by not paying attention. So uh, 
think that's my story. I just finished this talk yesterday. Okay, so our goals are protect the reefs from excess nitrogen, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the rice terraces, and then scale up by working with the Ministry of Agriculture. I work with the agricultural extension agents there. One of them has got his PhD with me. So we think if we can find solutions, they can be, it can be scaled up. But it means going beyond the model of us coming back and publishing a paper and instead working directly with people there. Uh, there are other people at the Earth Observatory, plug for the Earth Observatory, working now in collaboration with uh, the people, the Department of Oceans and Fisheries in Indonesia um, to study coral cores, to study ocean atmosphere couplings, and to study uh, the effects of uh, excess nitrogen on the reefs, done in collaboration with the people who are meant to manage those things. So I think that's a model especially here for Singapore. Great opportunities that we have in Singapore. All right, that's my story. Thank you very much.